Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents, it is a doctrine that was concocted, it was manufactured with a political purpose in mind, it was marketed very successfully, but it is not biblical, and the great Bible minds of the past never believed this. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Prophecy Code video series. Our presentation tonight is dealing with the subject of Revelation's Rapture. And we'll say more about the specifics of the rapture in just a moment. But our central focus of the presentation tonight is not only going to deal with the certainty and the eminence, the nearness of Jesus coming, but we're going to talk about how he's coming. You can read in Acts chapter 1, when he ascended up to heaven after his first coming, while the disciples watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And the Bible says then that... Behold, two men. Who are these two men? Angels, correct. They stood by in white apparel, and they said to the apostles, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, if you want to know something about how he's coming again, look at how he went. The Bible tells us that when Jesus went, he left in the clouds, he's coming in the clouds. When he left, he was real, he was visible. When he comes, he'll be real and he'll be visible. It was a real event. Keep in mind, as we study the subject of the second coming, the first words out of Jesus' mouth dealing with this subject was, take heed, be warned, be careful, watch out that no man deceive you. First thing he said is, there's going to be a lot of deception about my coming. So don't automatically assume that the popular notions must be true. And don't forget that the devil, what makes deception deception is he commingles truth with error. And so there's always going to be an element of truth in the error. What makes poison dangerous is when you mix it with good food, right? Jesus said, there will be many false Christs. Many will come in my name, saying I am Christ, and will deceive many. You know, I'm from California, and not far away is where Jim Jones had his temple. And I did some meetings in Santa Rosa nearby, and I baptized a gal who escaped from Jonestown just before they all committed suicide. Baptized her. She was in a wheelchair. And uh, she said when they first started following him, he was... You know, he used to be a Methodist preacher. Good church. Read the Bible. By the time they got to Jonestown, things had digressed and he had thrown away the Bible. As a matter of fact, they kept the Bible in the outhouse. And then, of course, Jesus warns us, when therefore they say unto you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. There are going to be people who say, Jesus is here, he's there, he's on the ground. He said, don't even go if they say that. Why? Because it'll be like lightning. And, of course, if... Behold, if he's in secret chambers, believe it not. If he's in a spaceship, then we're all supposed to gather. Like Marshall Applewhite said. A lot of deceptions, but you know, this is not the deception. These characters that are basically deranged people are not the ones I'm worried about. Have you ever met anybody who claimed to be Jesus? I have. <laughs> it was really scary, because I was all alone in the mountains when it happened. And... Um, some of you have heard this story. It's the only one I've got. Sorry, it's what happened to me. I, I, you heard me say, I used to live in a cave by myself. I'll say more about that later. And uh, I hesitate to say too much too soon because you might lose confidence. <laughs> but, uh, and I was a baby Christian. I read the Bible. I didn't know a lot about the Bible. And uh, I lived by myself up in this cave, way back in the mountains. And one day into my cave yard, I had a yard, this man came walking. <laughs> It's pretty nice as far as caves go. And, I mean, I was way out in this remote area, and the guy had brown shoulder-length hair, beard, mustache, tan skin, hazel or uh, kind of green eyes, uh, not a bad-looking guy, and, and medium build. 
And he came and sat down. I welcomed and asked him if he wanted something to eat. I thought he was just a hiker. And after he visited a little while, he told me he was Jesus. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if someone first says that, and you go, yeah. He wasn't laughing. <laughs> he was serious. Now, a couple of things go through your mind when that happens. I mean, this guy looked real intense. Uh, one thing you think is, I'm up here in the mountains all by myself with a lunatic. <laughs> and that was a little scary. And then I thought, well, I don't want to call him a lunatic. What if it is Jesus? I have a lot of questions to ask. And so you're not sure exactly what to say. And, you know, I was a baby Christian. And so I, I said to him, uh, uh, you know, you don't want to say, no, you're not. So I said, well, I've read in the Bible that when you come, that <laughs> you, you don't know what to say, that um, you're not going to touch the ground. We're going to be caught up to meet you in the air. He says, well, that's true. He said, and that's how I'm coming for the general populace, but I'm coming specially for a few people at first. And, you know, he had an answer for everything. He knew his Bible, which made him scary. And, you know, this went on. He, he, he ended up staying with me, and we had these prolonged Bible studies. And the more I read the Bible, the more I found this is not right. And not only that, he stayed with me three days. He didn't do any work. He ate all my food. <laughs> and I knew that Jesus would never do that. A few days later, I actually saw him down in Palm Springs, and he had found a disciple, some tall, skinny hippie was following him around and said, this is Jesus. <laughs> and uh, if he found another 11, I've really been worried. But <laughs> about a week later, I saw him on the streets again, and he had evidently gotten into a fight, and one of his eye teeth were knocked out. And I felt much better because I know Jesus has all his teeth. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, you know, we're not talking about these poor, deranged people like, you know, Jim Jones and David Koresh and Marshall Applewhite and this uh, ge gentleman in Japan who the sarin gas thing that they had. And there, there's all kinds of crazy people out there, and that's not what we're talking about. What if Satan should impersonate Christ? How would you know that it wasn't Jesus? We need to know something about how Jesus is going to come. What would you do if all of a sudden it appeared on the news one day that Jesus had arrived? All of a sudden there's a, a news report, and all around the world, uh, TV cameras are tuning in. Would you go and sit down in front of the TV? Would you think that Jesus had come? He looked just like Jesus, sounded just like Jesus. News reporters are saying, Jesus has returned, and all the cameras are flocking to hear the words and maybe doing some of the same miracles. Can the devil do some miracles? Doesn't Revelation say that he will perform wonders? How would you respond? We need to know how Jesus is coming. Now, I, I want to be very delicate in what I'm going to share because there are principally two conflicting views among Christians regarding how Jesus is going to come. You know, there are probably hundreds of different variants of those views, but there are two primary views. Let me share with you briefly what they are. The first view is that when the rapture occurs, the church will be caught up and the lost are left behind alive for seven years of tribulation. Then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back with the church that's been raptured and he then sets up his millennial kingdom here on earth. The other view is that the rapture takes place at the end of the time of tribulation. Now, virtually all Christians agree, and I hope if you hear something you didn't believe before, you don't agree with, that we can agree disagreeably. Does that sound fair? Are we Christians? Don't we want to study together and find out what the Bible teaches? I mean, isn't it time, when Jesus comes back, aren't we going to be united as a people? Amen. How's it ever going to happen if we don't study together, if we're not afraid to ask questions and explore? So, in a Christian way, let's look at these things and find out what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm not going to be hedgy, and I'll tell you right out, that when I first became a Christian, I worshipped with people who believed the popular view of what we call the secret rapture. The Bible doesn't really teach the word rapture. Rapture means to be carried away with force or power. And that's where actually you get the word rape. It means to be carried away by force or with power. And uh, we believed it was the secret, or at least the people I worship with did, and that the tribulation afterward, and that uh, we were caught up, and when the Lord came, people would suddenly disappear. It's basically the left-behind scenario that has been made very popular. And then there's the other view that is a more traditional view. Um, some of you maybe had heard about a famous book written by Hal Lindsey years ago called The Late Great Planet Earth. Let me give you a little history here. How many remember this book? I think, what is it, 15 million copies sold. Back in the 1500s, 
a Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera was commissioned by our Catholic friends to study Revelation and kind of come up with what they called a counter-interpretation because the Protestant movement, uh, the reformers, and I'm thinking of people like Luther and Zwingli and Melanchthon and Calvin, they taught that the church would be in the world during the tribulation and we were caught up when Jesus came back and the wicked were destroyed at that time. But the Catholics were really having struggles with the Protestants and so they said, we need a counter-interpretation. So Ribeiro wrote this interpretation that really didn't become very popular until a man named Darby, who was the founder of the Plymouth Brethren. Have you heard that church? It's called Darby's until he embraced that. And that still didn't take off, but what really made it popular was a man named Schofield. Any of you ever heard of the Schofield Bible? He incorporated Darby's interpretation of Revelation in his Bible notes. And how Lindsay believed that, as well as some others, and popularized it with some books. So that amazing thing that happened is Protestants began to believe the Jesuit interpretation of prophecy, which basically says, Revelation 4, when John hears a trumpet and he's caught up in vision, that's the rapture, and everything from Revelation 4 on happens after the church is left. Now that's one view. I don't believe that. What I'm going to share with you from the Bible is really a very old view. What I'm going to share with you, a more traditional view, is the view that was believed by, well, like I said, you know, Luther and Calvin and uh, Zwingli and, uh, and Tyndale and Wycliffe and uh, Billy Sunday and Dwight Moody and I could just go down the line. I mean, it was a very standard teaching until the last 80 years or so. In Hal Lindsey's book, for instance, he believed that because Israel was being established as a nation in 1948, for which I'm thankful, that a generation later, 1981, the rapture would take place. And then after seven years of tribulation in 1988, then Jesus would come back down with the church and establish his millennial kingdom. None of it happened. None of it happened. And yet they keep selling books. No public apology. No saying, you know, we were wrong. And this has been true over and over again. Some of those who embrace these things keep using this philosophy and it's falling apart. You've got Darbyism that teaches the pre-tribulation rapture. The secret rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation. And then you've got, um, and that also teaches it's not necessary really to understand the last 18 chapters of Revelation because the church will not be here during that fulfillment when the church disappears uh, because of the seven years of tribulation. By the way, can anyone here tell me where the scripture is that says seven years of tribulation? That's really putting my neck out on live television, international television, to invite you to give me a scripture. How many of you have heard? Turn a camera around in the studio. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Put your hands up. That's a pretty good group. And how many scriptures did we find? That ought to tell you something. That's very interesting. And then, of course, you've got what the reformers taught, which is where I am. And I, we can all love each other if we disagree. Amen? Let's study together. And you know what? If nothing else, even if you say, Doug, I, I know where I stand and you're not going to change my mind, fine. You owe it to yourself to at least understand your other brothers and sisters, right? So listen with an open heart and let's find out what, what each other believes. The Reformers taught that the rapture of the church takes place after the tribulation in the Bible. Let's talk about the tribulation for a second. Everyone here believes that Jesus is coming and when he comes and descends from heaven with a shout, we're caught up to meet him. That's the rapture. We're caught up to meet him. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and the plagues fell, don't forget the seven last plagues in Revelation are the tribulation. When the plagues fell on ancient Egypt, were the Israelites taken out of Egypt before or after the plagues? After the plagues. Were they in Egypt during the plagues? Yes. Did God protect them during the time of the plagues? Yes. Will we be protected during the time of the plagues? We don't need to worry about the plagues. Some people get so scared, they say, I don't want to believe the other way because I don't want to be in the world during the tribulation. You have nothing to fear. God will take care of you. That's what Psalm 91 says. Neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand. Only with your eyes will you see and behold the destruction of the wicked. Don't be afraid of the plagues. Did God save Noah from the flood? or through the flood? Ah. Did God save Job from his troubles or through them? Joseph, did he go through trials? Was he saved from them or through them? Daniel, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went through some trials. Did God save Daniel from the lion's den or through it? Did he save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace or through it? The Bible tells us, Paul says, it is through much tribulation we will enter the kingdom of God, he says in the book of Acts. So all through the Bible we find this example. Why does Jesus say in Matthew 24 to the church, he that endures to the end. Endures what? If we're going to go poof and disappear. And by the way, if whenever you're in doubt, believe the safe thing. If you like me believe that when Jesus comes the next time, that's it. You've got to be ready now, right? Amen. If I'm wrong, I'll apologize in heaven. But if you're wrong, and you're counting on a second chance, it's not safe. Now, some are saying, but Doug, it says in the Bible, Jesus is coming as a thief. Let's find out what the Bible teaches on that. Amen? He is coming as a thief. Does that mean that um, it, people are just going to disappear? Or does it mean it's going to be a surprise? I think it means it's a surprise. Does life go on here on earth for seven more years after Jesus comes as a thief? Let's read it in the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Many people stop right there. Keep reading. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which, it means in this day, the heavens pass away with a great noise. And the elements melt with fervent heat. And the earth and the things therein are burned up. So what? What's the condition of the world when Jesus comes as a thief? Does it look to you like life is going on and people are saying, I wonder where everyone went? No, when he comes as a thief, the elements are melting with fervent heat. Is it a surprise for the church or for the world? For the lost? Get your Bibles. You know, I, I read a lot of scripture on the screen, but I'd like to read this one. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in your Bible. Let's read another one here. We'll start with verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. What happens to the wicked when Jesus comes as a thief? Destruction. Does life go on for seven more years? Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they'll not escape. But you, brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Will the second coming of Christ be visible to all men? We've already found out it's very audible. What does the Bible say? Behold, he is coming with the clouds and how many eyes? Every eye will see him. And again, you can read in Matthew 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they will see. They will what? They'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's a glorious event. That's not something secret. And then shall appear the, uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and all the tribes of the earth will, um, will mourn. It shall appear in the heavens. They'll see it. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So right away, you know that if someone calls you on the telephone and says, Go grab your paper. Look on the front porch, see your paper. Turn on the news. Did you know Jesus came? You're not going to be watching reporters and pundits talking about, well, what was it like for you? And putting the microphone up in someone's face. Well, you know, there was this bright cloud and all of a sudden people started popping up out of the ground. And It's not going to happen like that. When he comes again, everybody's going to know this event. That's not something secret. And then shall appear the, uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and all the tribes of the earth will, um, will mourn. It shall appear in the heavens. They'll see it. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So right away, you know that if someone calls you on the telephone and says, go grab your paper, look on the front porch, see your paper, turn on the news, did you know Jesus came? You're not going to be watching reporters and pundits talking about, well, what was it like for you? And putting the microphone up in someone's face. Well, you know, there was this bright cloud and all of a sudden people started popping up out of the ground. And it's not going to happen like that. When he comes again, everybody's going to know. Amen? It's the most glorious. It's the climax of the Bible is when Jesus comes. A matter of fact, I'll submit to you, I believe that anybody who came here tonight with no preconceived ideas would never come to the place where they believe the secret rapture. It is a doctrine that was concocted, it was manufactured with a political purpose in mind, it was marketed very successfully, but it is not biblical, and the great Bible minds of the past never believed this. How may we know when we are near the last generation? 
Well, I've just given you some indicators. We talked about a few earlier. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? People will be scoffing, making fun of the second coming. Do we have that today? Also, the Lord has warned us in His Word that as it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? There was a great deal of spiritual immorality. Am I right? Perversion. Do we see that very prominent today? Uh, people with perverted lifestyles are clamoring for attention and endorsement. And you're not allowed to call anything wrong anymore without being called intolerant. Oh, by the way, God is intolerant of some things. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come. This is verse 1. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Are we living in an age where people are lovers of pleasure? It's like we live for entertainment. And, uh, you know, if the remote control breaks, we're bummed. And what are we going to do now? You know, or the VCR is broken. What are we going to do? Cable went out. We just are constantly need to be entertained. What is the purpose of Jesus coming? Now, some people think, oh, he's coming to get even. That's not why Jesus is coming. Jesus tells us why he's coming. John chapter 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Why does he want to get us? Why is he coming? To receive us. He wants to be with us. He says, Father, I pray that those you've given me will be with me. What a privilege. Jesus, I want you with me. He loves you. And again, he says, and behold, <clears throat> this is in um, Revelation 22, 12, last chapter in the Bible. Behold, I come quickly. And if that was true then, boy, is it true today. And my reward is with me to give to every man. He's coming to give rewards. He's also coming for the restitution of all things. There's a number of reasons. But he's really coming to gather his children. He sends his angels to gather together his elect. Are the wicked destroyed? Yes. Why? By the brightness of his coming. It's because they still have sin in them. And the presence of the Lord, the light of God, is a consuming fire on the lost. What will happen to the righteous people when Jesus comes a second time? Well, there's a number of things in the Bible. First Thessalonians, we've already looked at, but let's review that. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and then the dead in Christ will rise first. So the righteous Christians who are alive in the world don't go before the dead who are resurrected when Jesus comes. The graves are opening up when Jesus comes. Does that sound like a secret to you? And this is happening in concert with this massive earthquake. All the graves in the world opening up. You know how many graves there must be that the angels have marked all over the planet? And the Bible even says the sea gave up the dead. Notice what we've learned about Jesus coming tonight. It tells us in the Bible it is a literal coming. He's going to come like he left. It's personal. He was real when he left. He'll be real when he comes. It's visible. Every eye will see him. It's audible. A shout, a roar, thunder, lightning. Very physical. The earth is going to shake. Every one of your senses will be assaulted with the reality of Jesus coming, according to the Bible. It's vitalizing. A resurrection is taking place. Bodies are being transformed. It's glorious. The angels are there filling the heavens. It's climatic, meaning it's the end. That's where those that are saved are saved and those that are lost are lost. There's no extension. When God told Noah to get in the ark, did he give a second chance to those that stayed outside? When God said, Lot, get out of town, did he extend probation for those in Sodom and Gomorrah? And Jesus says, I'm coming back. It's like the days of Lot. It's like the days of Sodom. Get ready because that will be it. The curtain's going down, friends. These fanciful scenarios that have become so popular are dangerous. And we need to know what the Bible really teaches. You know, we're running out of time. And it's so important that we put Jesus first in our lives. Friends, I want to pray for you right now. And I want to pray for those who are watching. He's brought you because he wants you to be ready. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, loving Lord, we are so thankful that you have arrested our attention tonight. Some of us may be uh, troubled by the things that we've learned in our souls, and we hope that's the Holy Spirit. We can see that every one of our senses will be bombarded with the reality of Jesus coming when he comes. I pray that our conclusions will be rooted in the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that 
each person will hear you speak to their hearts and know that they can be ready, that you've sent these messages because you want them to be prepared, that you'll receive us if we come to you just as we are. And right now in each person's heart, I pray that they will say, Lord, I want to be ready. I can't do it without you. But through Christ, all things are possible. Help me to be ready and waiting and packed when Jesus comes. We ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Hello, friends. The program you're watching is the culmination of a dream and a mission. Let me tell you about the mission. Amazing Facts believe strongly in the great commission given by Christ in Matthew chapter 28 to share the wonderful news of salvation with the entire world. There are billions of people on this planet that are in desperate need of a change in their lives. We believe that a spiritual encounter with God is the only way to affect real change. Now let me tell you about the dream. Amazing Facts started in 1966 after the founder of this ministry, Joe Cruz, decided to take the mission of sharing God's Word with everyone personally. Since then, we have shared this wonderful message about God with millions around the world through our free Bible school, free Bible study guides, our television, radio, and internet ministries. During Pastor Doug Batchelor's 10-day health and gospel mission trip to Southeast India, we witnessed over 15,000 individuals surrender their lives over to Christ. We are currently building 70 churches in that region. If you've been blessed by this program and would like to join with us in this mission of taking the gospel to the world, why not call to become a partner in evangelism? Our partners have decided to consistently contribute to our efforts in sharing this message that has changed not only my life, but the lives of countless others. If you'd like to join our partners, share a testimony or contribute a gift, contact us today. Friends, the most amazing fact of all is that God loves us and cares for us and that He has a plan for your life. Prayerfully consider joining our efforts. Until next time, may God continue to hold you in the palm of His hand. World events have never been more unstable than today. Terrorism, disasters, bizarre weather. What does the Bible reveal about future events? Learn the amazing answer in this stunning 43-minute documentary entitled The Final Events of Bible Prophecy. During this special broadcast, you can get your very own copy of this gripping DVD free. You pay only $6.95 for shipping and handling. Go to the phone and call the number on your screen. Don't miss out on this special offer. Friends, the Old Testament foretold that God would send His Son to come the first time as the world's sacrifice and Savior. Well, He came right on time. Then Jesus promised before the world's destruction, He would come again, gloriously as King of Kings to rescue His children. This will be the climax of Earth's history, and God does not want you to be left behind. You can learn more about the Second Coming of Christ in the free study guide we've prepared for you, entitled, Ultimate Deliverance. You won't want to miss out on what this study guide reveals will happen when Jesus returns. Please call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 105. Or if you prefer, you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 105, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have today for this edition of Amazing Facts.